Welcome to the Tai Chi Podcast. I've got with me a, a good friend and colleague, Steve Sharkey from the UK. Steve and I have been having some conversation over text. I thought I would read this last message that you wrote. So uh, the audience is going to sort of catch us midstream while we're in the middle of our discussion, which I think is appropriate because we're really talking about wanting to make advances in Tai Chi. Steve says, uh, so where did it get lost? Did Yang Lu Chan have it? This is a very important and deep matter because in enhancing a great system, the wise path, I think, needs some sort of change. Look at Taekwondo and Aikido, both frozen in time like fossils, as nobody has the guts to pick up the gauntlet. Yang Lu Chan was an innovator and visionary, not an antique collector. So this immediately brings up about your background. Maybe we can weave that in as we go. But uh, what was behind this statement you made, Steve? Well, sir, basically, um, looking at Tai Chi the way it is today, uh, the majority of people are doing Tai Chi for health. And then you think of the name Tai Chi Chuan, Grand Ultimate Fist. And that's why I got involved with Tai Chi. Uh, 25 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So I was a servant police officer. I uh, had no interest in Tai Chi because it was for health and for old people. That's That was the general uh, consensus. Um, and then um, I started to train with Sifu Ray Bullock. And in the first class, well, we had a, a private class. The first class, he showed me stuff. That stunned me. I had no idea the depth of real Tai Chi. Um, and so over the past 25 years, I've trained with him and a number of other people. Um, looking for the genuine Grand Ultimate Fist. But this is actually on top of other martial arts that you've done, including what you teach now, which is kickboxing. Sir. So can you weave that in uh, for us? Well, you know, yeah. You, you, have the you have a black belt in Taekwondo. You have... So look down in, in Taekwondo, fifth down in kickboxing. Um, I've been training since 1975, okay. originally hung out in Liverpool. Um, and I've done everything over the past 50 years. I've been searching and researching everything that I could find. Everything Eddie. diverse from, uh, from the, obviously, Kung Fu, Chinese arts, uh, the, the Korean arts. Um, everything I could find, I've been searching and, and researching. Um, and then obviously when um, Sifu Ray Bullock showed me the Tai Chi, I was stunned because I thought to myself, this is something I can use in my line as a, a police officer where I can take control of people without causing them harm. Mm. And that's what so it sold me on it. Um, and over the past 25 years, I've been looking uh, to find the real grand ultimate fist. You've studied, you've studied several systems already. Yes, sir. With, with Sifu Ray, it started in, in Yang. Uh, then he went on to t teach us Chen. Um, and I've done Sun Style as well. And then uh, there was also uh, Montak Cha, whose, whose form you teach in your class. Yes, sir. Yes, the reason why I teach that small, short form is that um, when I'm teaching my Tai Chi, it's mainly for health. That's what m most people are interested. My personal interest is in the application of real Tai Chi. Uh, but the majority of people who come to Tai, I I tai Chi are just, just looking for, it, it for health. And so, how, do you, how do you bring this together with, well, I know that in your uh, belt testing, uh, you also incorporate jujitsu. Yes, sir. Yeah, I try. I try to. Yeah, I try to provide everything from the students. Uh, my main instructor over the years has been Master Frank Murphy from Cork, um, and the main thing he always pushed on us was integrity. You have to teach with integrity. So I've always wanted to provide my students with honest martial arts that actually work. Um, hence, that's why I'm involved with yourself now, sir. Now, um, you contacted me, and uh, we've had some 
uh, amazing research that we're doing. In fact, in your own school with one of your black belts, you're now implementing, with my help, a uh, Tai Chi protocol for the third done testing. So, also, let me just say that you've been encouraging me to call it real Tai Chi. Yes, sir. Uh, now, this is in all due respect to Yang Sao Chung, but um, in the midst of coming out with this the last couple of years, I noticed that there were, if I was to really, in good conscience, promote Tai Chi again after leaving for 36 years, after very intense exposure and training at the professional instructor level uh, from my teens to 30, then I would only with good conscience need to bring in advancements that I saw were needed due to the fact that the traditional training, powerful as it is, lacked balance, uh, had not incorporated psychology, sports science, human potential, women's differences, and, and so forth. So that's what I brought in. And with all due respect to the traditional young system, the essence which I'm fully dedicated to preserving and the name that I'm fully dedicated to promoting, Yang Sao Chung is not known in the Tai Chi world. Yet he's the fourth generation eldest son of Yang Cheng Fu, who is the one who made it the most famous in the world. So uh, it's not really a question of what happened. Uh, there's way too much information out there to for anybody to really need to ask that question anymore. Uh, yet the method is so different. Uh, I would say, in my personal opinion, more precise, more authentic, that it just... Um, it's a really hard thing to sell to a community that is already saturated with Tai Chi, uh, saturated with the standard, a way of practice. And that's also understood from a sociological point of view. We can understand that. So we really don't have any bones to pick in terms of feeling bitter. I don't have a personal investment since I'm not anymore a young uh, disciple, you know, in the sense that I, I have some turf to defend. And then I met you who has such a refreshing view on wanting to keep an open mind and recover the original Yang family, yet you're also open to the modern enhancements. I find that quite uh, refreshing. Given this, what do you propose we do? I mean, we, we don't want it to become, as you said, uh, and I, I know little about, less about these disciplines, the Aikidos and the Taekwondos, uh, what you described as a fossil you might get some uh, reaction on that but uh, <laughs> but but uh let me just qualify that what your your main focus as a law enforcement uh is on what can be used now in real situations in real self-defense situations i really admire your teachings on self-defense not just for women having dredged up or preserved some of these very, very excellent uh, teachings by self-defense and trying to some of the top in the world, actually, who've devel developed for the military or so forth, these very simple, almost scientifically derived methodologies. So that's, that's your niche. Your niche is not recreation. Your niche is not to become part of the Tai Chi community. It is what can be used in martial arts in general. In fact, as I know, you you keep your kickboxing very, very separate from this interest that you're discussing with me. You're very clear that kickboxing is a sport. Indeed, sir. Yeah. Yeah, there's a huge difference between uh, kickboxing and real violence you know, on the streets. Um, and sadly, there isn't enough instructors being honest about that. Um, but my background with reality... It was, was back in 95 when the UFC was coming along, which was, was a breath of fresh air. But Jeff, Jeff Thompson uh, from Coventry uh, was also uh, coming on, onto the scene. And um, he, he, was, he was the person who, who turned self-defense around the world on, you know, on its head. Um, I used to go and train with the man and uh, hold him in such high, high regard. And what did Jeff Thompson do in a nutshell? In a nutshell, he basically said that everybody's bottle goes in the fight. 
um, and he taught people how to handle fear and use fear um, as a weapon. And he was honest. He's just, as Master Murphy said, it's in integrity. So the guy was honest. So everyone else who was misleading people. They, they may not even know that they were misleading. Well, that's the sad, that's the sad thing, sir, yeah, is that people who have been taught by these grand masters who've never actually been in a co confrontation um, believe it's, yeah, there's so many people trying to hit a square peg into a round hole. They've never, like, when I speak to yourself and we discuss about um, our experiences of real violence, it's great to listen to you, sir, and your experiences. Um, but there's so many people out there who think they're teaching people how to ha handle themselves, and they've got no idea. They've got no idea about how adrenaline can, can, can wreck every plan you have. The fact that in 30 seconds, your cardio will be gone. Um, and then the worst case scenario is if someone is drug drugged up, what's going to work against a person like that if you're not aware that this could be a, a possibility? And then on top of that, you differentiate between tournament fighting and the real fighting, the real yes, life and death yes. situation. Absolutely. I think there's a great value in, 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 in tournaments for beginners to go there and experience ad adrenaline. But it's a million miles away from uh, standing on the streets at three o'clock in the morning with a drunk in your face. Um, there's just no comparison. There's no comparison. Now, uh, uh, a lot of people, uh, uh, fortunately, would not ever be in your situation. But uh, in my view, and why I appreciate your message, is because psychologically, we're always at 3 o'clock in the morning against drunks uh, in terms of social interaction with people. It may not be physical, but there's a, a the Chinese especially – in the signs that I recovered from the Imperial Palace, draw a direct line between mastering the principles of physical confrontation and social that's not physical. They understood the principle, the common line, the common principle that brings the two together so that if you become experienced in one, that should translate to the other. And that's been lost. In your women's self-defense classes, for example, you are not promulgating fear, but you're giving them tools to handle that. And that should naturally translate to their personal lives, uh, the social, social lives and relationships. Yeah. The, the ultimate thing there is, um, as you say in, in Tai Chi, is the aw awareness the ultimate thing is to not be there in the first place. Right. That's that's the big tool. That's the big tool. Do you know your personal you know, awareness? Oh yeah, yeah, and and uh, that applies to everyone who's watching. The the length that the Chinese took this was in terms of just your everyday relationships. And that is, you meet someone and you size up. Is this is getting to know this person good for me or not? It could be immediate or long-term. But the ability to read the situation hinges on knowing thyself. And so much of Tai Chi that we've discussed, uh, and martial arts in general, is about external situations. How do you react in this and that? And the, the lack of the internal, of, of the inner reflection, of the inner uh, cultivation or character rectification is missing in the actual form training or the actual practice itself, which, as we've been discussing, should directly transform your thinking and make you more humble and make you more realistic about life in general, rather than what we're, we see so many places of people who are living in, in a, a bubble, a very safe, hermetically sealed bubble, They've, they've mastered their craft within that bubble and then it elevates their sense of who they are. And that's not three o'clock in the morning with a drunk in your face in an alley. 
in this area. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I I wouldn't like people to think that I'm just into the, the violent side of the art. I love the art, the art. You know, I love to do my form. I love the energy work. I love the, the meditation. Uh, that's why I'm into tai, tai Chi. I love the art. Uh, but it's sadly, it's sad that it's lost its place where it should be. Uh, it should be all things to all, all people. Um, and it's only a small element which is being taught, which um, I think is sad. Well, tell me about Yang Luchan. What is your thoughts on Yang Luchan? You, you so highly respect and revere the Yang family uh, that you've been discovering about. And could you tell me something about that and why your comment? Well, I'm thinking with Yang Luchan, um, he wasn't employed in the Imperial Palace to teach people um, an art that was going to take five or, or, or ten years to, to master. I personally don't understand that. If he wasn't teaching directly himself, his sons would have been teaching the Imperial Guard. And so you've got a lot of young soldiers there who were to be taught how to protect the Emperor. Now, he would in his contract, I'm sure it wasn't you have five or ten years to accomplish this. It would be months. It would be a matter of months. So I'd like to know what he was teaching these guys in the 1850s, which was lost in the 1920s, hmm. or appears to have been lost. Well, it was definitely use, right? It was definitely for use, insofar as... Tai Chi mastery has been equated with mastery in pushing hands. And I think with all the masters being called to the floor now in this mixed martial arts environment, uh, can that really be used and so forth? And then what's happened in China with the challenges to the Tai Chi masters and so forth, it's really calling Tai Chi to the carpet and begging the real wheat to be separated from the chaff. What is the real Tai Chi? It's not just in the combat situation. It's about life situation. That's the real Tai Chi. If it's grand ultimate, it should help you in every aspect of life. Just wanted to confirm that that's the real meaning behind real Tai Chi from your point of view. Yes, sir. Oh, the, yeah, the, the, the Tai Chi... I train, I look for now and, and, and train it, is is the fact that I'm able to protect myself is is the icing on the cake. The cake itself is the art. Um, where So I'm not just wasting my time moving around slowly. I'll, I want a result, but at the same time, I do enjoy the art. I enjoy the forms. Um, I'm now hoping to enjoy this, 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 this sword form, which I would never have any interest in you know, in the past. But when you see you, uh, you, you know, yourself with the sword, and I'm thinking, yeah, that, that would be something nice. So the cultural side, the energy side, the health side, the meditation side, I love all of that, and I want all of that in my Tai, in tai Chi. Yes, in your class, you make a big distinction between sport fighting and self-defense. In fact, you've got absolutely, sir. You've got your yeah. persons, right? Yes, sir. Because I think if you don't do that, you lull your students into a false sense of security. I don't want them to realize they've been working at a sport when they're on the streets, and they could end up in, you know, in uh, in in the hospital. I want them to know knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. I don't believe that people are born tough. I believe that. Uh, Tough guys learn. It's an education. So knowledge is power. And even if at the at the simplest le level, if they're aware of what might occur, that's half the battle. It's when they're shocked, when they're on the street and they're shocked. They're shocked that there's 20 punches raining down into 20 seconds and they're just o overawed. So, um, yeah, so I, I think... Teach them with in integrity, and if you are if you are teaching a martial art, you should be able to empower your students, not not fill them.
so that um, teaching with integrity means teaching with clarity, that you're very clear that this is what we're doing now, this is what we're doing. You know, and I think the reason why we, we're really coming together uh, in collaboration is because that's exactly what I'm trying to reestablish in, in Taiji Trend with, uh, for example, my five phase protocol, which is forms, then long power or the hard power, and then the yielding power or short power, and then the distance and timing, and then the meditation self repair to recover the original skills that you mentioned were in the Imperial Palace. And that, because of my direct experience with uh, Yang Chung and with his disciples and family, I got to experience directly what it felt like and looked like in his presence as he moved and he, as he did things. And for those who never met Yang Chung but just heard about him, you need, to, you need to understand that he was the real deal. He came from a generation of the fourth generation and then immigrating from China to Hong Kong where it was used for real. So he was like the cop on the beat. That was his entire orientation to Tai Chi. And you can see it in his eyes. You can see it in the way he reacted to sounds, to things that I did, for example. Everything was tuned in. Uh, sixth Sense was super keen, almost like reading minds. This is the type of original Tai Chi that he succeeded in bringing to fourth generations from the first generation. He really was, and there might have been gaps in between, but he had succeeded in uh, reincarnating his great-grandfather Yang Lu Chan's standard and orientation to the art. And a lot of it was environmental. He grew up with his father, and his father fought, um, and, and disciples, which were his boxing brothers, fought and really put it to the test. And yet, at the same time, in one of my podcasts, uh, Yang Sheng Fu's Dubious Choice, I posit the theory that Yang Cheng Fu might have held certain aspects of the training back just for Yang Sao Chung and not given it to others, although they got prime training aside from that. A little controversial, but it's almost like the, the elephant in the room. This training, which is very deep, it goes beyond just shoving people back and forth, it's a very deep relationship you have with the teacher where they bring you in to capture the essence, which is, in my view, the real power source of the Yang family method. And then everything else revolves around this seed that begins to grow, sprout, and turn into a garden. So th this is part of our discussion, but I needed to qualify the fact that Yang Sao Chung, in my view, it's really about meeting that person and the way they did things, the way they moved, the way it felt uh, on making contact. It was his entire body had that repelling power. It wasn't just his hands. And then it that extended out to a type of presence that uh, went beyond the body. He wasn't just a, an animal, but he was almost like uh, a, a wild jaguar or leopard or tiger or lion that just turns his head and looks at you. There's just, he was able to tap as a human being this utterly primitive or primal and animalistic side, which in Chinese science belongs to the lung. It's a paw. It's the animism. So this this within the Chinese constitutional makeup of the body, all of this is encompassed. And that's one of the problems today. Without a real knowledge of Chinese culture and the complete system, what people are doing is taking some mind-body exercise and some 
uh, pushing hands techniques, and then they're overlaying that with their own culture, their own values, their own beliefs, their own standards. And that's one of the real sufferings I see and the reason for 250 million Tai Chi practitioners in the world. A lot of them now, uh, 20, 30, 40 years of experience who I'm meeting. And what they do is they, 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 like you, they see the grand ultimate label. They see it's only good for a part of their life, but it's good. So they keep it going, but then they have to outsource and find their spirituality or their psychology or even their combat uh, from other, other systems and styles. Uh, so one of my missions is to try to bring that back as a system. How would Taiji be used in the close quarter situation, in your situations? And we've already been uh, going through some of that with some of your top students. So it's been very, very rich research because you have the background. It's very frustrating working with people who say they want that, but they don't have the background. It's just nothing I can talk to them about. So I, I appreciate you. I appreciate you for what you bring in. So what do you think ha happens here in the 1920s? We all know what happened post-1948, sadly. But what happened in the 1920s? You know, you think about this. Yang Lu Chan was hired to teach the imperial bodyguard. And then, then he was teaching his sons to teach inside the imperial palace. But then his grandson, um, I know that they were involved with this Beijing physical culture re research group where um, the top guy from the Wu style was there, the top guy from Sun style was there, and Yang, uh, Yang Chen Fu. Um, so between uh, 1915, I think it was, to about 1925, um, it seems to have lost something in that space of time. To the general public, I mean. You know, there was uh, Yang Cheng Fu's notable disciples. They continued to promulgate and teach his system. He passed on in 1932, was it? 36, I think, sir. Okay. Yeah, I, I might be wrong. Okay, well, he passed on in the in the around the 1930s. So you're asking what happened in China the last 10 years of his life? Mm, yeah. Uh, well, I, you know, we, we, there was the, the warlords and the, the turmoil and the oh. Japanese invasion. Oh, the, fall, the, the fall of the empire in, in 1906. Yeah. So part of mayhem in China. Yeah. I just wonder what why i would have thought the the chinese government would have wanted him more than ever then to be teaching the army or whatever um rather than him, him fading i i don't know enough about the history there uh but are, are you talking about the public acknowledgement of of yang cheng fu yes sir yeah yeah to go you know to go to go from being in the imperial Palace and teaching the Imperial Guard to then 1930s, it's a health system. And I just think about the e evolution of that and what what was potentially lost, chucking the baby out with the bathwater. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm not, because I don't have such detailed uh, information, but I, I'm catching your drift here. Uh, we know that his disciples consistently throughout sought to maintain this original standard. But what he did was began to standardize it, to popularize it for health. There was, it was like a separate project he took on that then really uh, brought Taiji out of the cellar and made it into a public and easy, easier to access uh, exercise. That clearly was done to the end of his life. And if you look at Chen Longshang, uh, Li Ashren's disciple in Chengdu, you'll see that final form 
that Yang Cheng Fu rendered it into. It was not the popular form that we see Yang Jun doing from Yang Zhen Duo. That was an earlier version. You see that with the the, the back step coming forward, not pausing at the uh, struck foot. But with the final version, you see Chen Longshang bringing the back foot up to the uh, stable foot, making an adjustment and then stepping forward. You can see how that would be more amenable to people as they got older, or if they're using it for health rehabilitation. But what's being popularized today would be the Yang Zhendor form and the uh, Fu Zhongwen form, where it, it was still the original stepping through that strut. And when you look at older people doing it, it sometimes looks very awkward because it's not what old people should be doing. They should be stabilizing and then resting and then stepping forward rather than lurching forward with the foot and so forth. So there's just one observation of many. But um, because Tai Chi went through such evolution, I think what we see today among the 250 million practitioners, we see the the public recreational style. So they've, they've taken out the martial component. And we have to give credit for him having done that because it's what popularized it, right? So, yeah. And then, uh, per Yang Chang Fu's dubious choice, the styles of his, the disciples of his that have come out, have done it without the G power pressing. So, that, in my opinion, given the potential for this training because it's so focused to actually lead to negative side effects it happened to me happened to practically every single one of my tai chi brothers who trained heavily with me there's something about it that if it's not approached scientifically modern scientifically it could lead to so much imbalance and with that a lot of other negative effects uh, we see fallout everywhere in terms of dysfunction between the teacher, the student, the organizations that focus so much on this power. It's called Zohorumo, which means to uh, walk along the fire, then fall in to hell. It just it's, You're walking the razor's edge when you deal with such power. So I actually feel at this time that it was a wise choice for Yang Cheng Fu to only promote the yielding method, which now has taken off a life of its own. So this, that, that's the second iteration. The first was from the original that he recreationalized it, which gave it more than one presentation. It wasn't consistent. So you're sort of questioning what's the real one. And then he withheld this and left it for only Yang Sao Chung and promoted the yielding, which has taken a life of its own, but is one of the reasons why Tai Chi is a laughing stock among the fighters today, because when you lack the core power, what I call spontaneous discharge, you're lacking what Tai Chi is really unique and special for. In my opinion, nothing matches the Tai Chi power in martial arts. And now that's up for question because of this phase two treatment. And now, the last two and a half years, I've been trying to revive Yang Sao Jung's original method with a lot of caveats that we need to make sure it's done right. Seeing the fallout from modern people doing this uh, in an unhealthy way. And that it could even mean premature aging, Steve. Because with the turtle back posture and too much focus on this bouncing and so forth, it taxes you in certain ways that uh, someone in aging research, a modern scientist in aging research would be able to calculate. And I've done exercise physiology research on Tai Chi and aging. When I was a graduate student, I did du a double dissertation. Uh, I was doing my main psychology at Boston University, but I, I was also invited to be a principal investigator at Tufts University at the uh, Government Center on Aging. And I did a two-year research on Tai Chi, uh, the effects of Tai Chi in preventing premature aging. And to be honest with you, the research wasn't that convincing. Unlike a lot of research 
uh, that's been published. This this sports exercise physiology facility was for runners and cyclists and competitive athletes, not to test 60-year-old Tai Chi practitioners. Mm-hmm. And so that's another thing I really admire about your training and your third done black belt in Tai Chi and that you're going to maintain the fitness side of it that you have for their 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 hard style martial arts. So we're on a mission to recover the original Tai Chi yet with total fitness concept and mental health concept. Absolutely, sir. Yeah. In, in real violence when people go hands on if if they if they don't don't get the upper hand in the first couple of se- s- s- seconds um it and it goes on for 30 seconds people will hit a wall and th- they need to realize that you know someone's coming at net, well yeah the, the reality is you need to cover all all bases um, and being a textbook but martial art isn't going to cut it so this this is just me conjecturing, but these three phases of Yang Jung Fu's last twenty years, where he kept the system to Yang Sao Chung, who was born in nineteen ten. Okay, so that would have been nineteen twenty when Yang Sao Chung was ten years old, and then he would have been twenty when Yang Cheng Fu uh, at, in nineteen thirty, right? So if anyone got the essence training with his father for 27 years or so, or being with his father for 27 years, it would be Yang Sao Chung. Yes, sir. Yeah. He's a young man training with his dad while his siblings were was, was, was small kids. Um, yeah. Also, out of Yang Cheng Fu's senior disciples were much older. They were men. When Yang Sao Chung was a boy. Okay. But what happens in terms of the method is if you give someone the, the true method, the real method, then they can they can become superior to even a devoted disciple uh who didn't get that whole method. And that's one of the characteristics of the Yang family that a lot of people don't know. I know directly because I was trained as to become a professional. Tai Chi instructor, then I uh, decide not to. But the methods can actually determine the growth. Precise control. And that's exactly what Yang Sao Chung did with his three disciples. He chose to give one this, the other one this, the other one that, knowing how they would turn out. Quite amazing. Sir. I, I mean, the art's quite amazing. To have Indeed. that degree of uh, yeah. sophistication. Yeah, I always think there's a, you know, an on, onion. You know, as soon as you get past one, one layer, there's another layer, another layer, and it just goes deeper and deeper and deeper. It's fascinating and it is amazing. Yeah. It's the, the Chinese depth. box. It's the, the Yang Lu Chan's discovery in the layered method, in that you could take one move, you could take one move, and then you can say, okay, do it this other way. And it, it suddenly changes. And then, okay, now, now do it this way. Add this to it. And then it changes again. The Chinese book. That's what I experienced. And I held for decades because I didn't know what to do with it. There was nothing in the Taiji community that would be receptive. And so that's been the campaign thus far to bring this out, that this the solo form, for example, or pushing hands are not monolithic entities. They're not just this one and done type of thing where, okay, I got it. No, it's deep and it goes way beyond simply changing the form to fast or slow or to big or small movements. That's still external. What's missing is this one exercise because you have to do this from a standing position. There's only one way to do it. And that's against someone else. There's no big or small frame. It's just straight learning to put out power in a way that, matches your training partner that you can do it together with your training partner and there's only one way to stand (laughs) you see it cuts through everything through all these claims that this form will get you this 
this form will get you that. It's when I see the teachers doing that, uh, there's no blame, but it's just an understanding that of course they don't understand because they don't do this. So that's where Tai Chi stands today. And in terms of real Tai Chi, yet we have to be careful and not just throw this out there, assuming that it's the all-in-one solution to just start shoving people this way and maintaining structure. That's just the very beginning. Yeah, I think I think the, the, the great thing is, is there's enough people out there now who are passionate about Tai, tai Chi um, and are fed up uh, with all the, uh, the the circus stunts and want to teach real Tai Chi. Um, I know of people in this country um, who are of the same mind, and I'm sure there's people all around the world. I think it's a time, a real, this is the time now for real Tai Chi to get real, basically. Yeah, and also, even though you may not use these words, I, I can feel it in your consciousness because when you say real, you really mean it. You really mean real. But I've also been meeting senior practitioners who've done it for 30 years. It's so, such a huge population. And these people have their own life. They see the limitations. They've seen the, they've been part of the politics even of, um, and have been turned off by that but recognize and practice Tai Chi for the benefits. Yet they've had to outsource and do other work like spiritual work in order to, or healing work because the Tai Chi they knew did not include that in it. So in my podcast four, where I propose the four pillars of the spiritual consciousness that I witnessed and experienced in Yang Sao Chung, he was extraordinary in his attainment but I feel that maybe because they weren't scholars, that there weren't a lot of uh, transmission or, or vocabulary or words that would describe it. In other words, he was a man of action, and all the youngs were men of action. They were ultimate doers, and that's why they constantly had people interpreting for them, scholars who in a lot of cases interpreted wrong because they, they couldn't understand, right, the magnitude. So, again, that's one of my hopes is that I can make use of having known him and his family directly to help bring back that standard of consciousness that he represented. And it really is the classical high attainment of what the Chinese considered to be a human being, not a yeah. spiritual being, not a spiritual being but a human being, which is integrated in heaven, human, and earth. But what's missing in Taiji Tran is the connection between the heaven, human, and earth and the internal organ system, which is something that needs to come in now because Taiji Tran, let's say in the, have you heard of the Ba Men Wu Bu, the eight gates and five steps? It's a very, oh, sorry, sorry. It, it, it's, it's one of the biggest foundation theories and tai chi today that's found in the classics so people are just pouring over that as the the doctrine because what you have is the eight plus five equals 13 and that's the 13 energies so what i found in my claim that tai chi trends has forgotten the medicine or never had it not sure that's we need to look at that more clearly was that the focus of the 13, the 5 plus 8, is only on techniques. It's on techniques. It's on external energies. It's on how to cultivate. These are all doings. These are all external. When there's a yin complement to that, what I call the inner ba min wu bu, and that is the relationship between the five elements and the eight trigrams. I brought that to China in 2008. I presented in a, a professional psychology and medicine conference, bringing back the tradition. And all the cameras came out when I put the diagrams. And they stated at the end of my lecture that Dr. Yuan has recovered one of China's hidden treasures. 
This was in 2008. So I got confirmation. And what that essentially was, was the evolution of the five elements and eight trigrams throughout Chinese civilization that came through finally in its final classical iteration in the 1850s through Bagua trend, through Donghai trends, Bagua trend. So that theory of the organs and how the body is constructed constitutionally as a complete science, which the Chinese had, and that was called the way of the Shengren, the way of the Shengren, the universal human, had that knowledge of the complete system. And just to flip over to your women's self-defense, women are different from men because women are constitutionally hardwired more completely than we are. We sort of have to build bridges to get places. And therefore, we have the uh, the golf ladder or the tennis ladder in Wimbledon, right? You have the different ladders that you can earn your way up through merit. But women are very different. And women need to know the whole deal before they can really, with determination and conviction, pursue something. This complete system was transmitted by a lineage of Chinese women at that time that I've recovered. So it's for us, because men at the highest attainment practice according to women's principles. Therefore, you get the refined gentleman, yet he's a martial art master. That's the image we have. Mr. Miyagi and Karate Kid, right? Very refined. He's not this brute. He's thoughtful. And then when he beats uh, his his violent brother, Sato, remember that? Who was uh, a complete martial art master, yet not cultivated inside. I think that's what that movie represents, is that the Asian arts have another layer or level of attainment that has to do with inner. Well, from the Chinese point of view, and when we open up the men, women difference box, we see that women learn from Z to A and men learn from A to Z. That means that when we, as we become advanced in our true real practice, we become refined. Z. But women start from Z day. They need to know what the ultimate standard is. And part of that is what you bring in. It's what is it like to be using this in real life and death situation? That's Z. That's martial arts in its true expression as a survival tool. That's what you that's what you teach is the Z for women. And now what we're going to be adding for women is that ladder all the way to A to help them take that and then bring it to the ground. So without this distinction between women and men, which I've recovered from uh, the Chinese archives, we have no direction at all for either men or women. That's why we have the yin yang. So this is missing in martial arts or Tai Chi and in life in general. It just gets deeper and deeper. Does it, make, does it make sense though? I, it sounds sort of simplistic, you know, Z to A, A to Z, but you've been teaching women for 30 years. Once I mentioned this notion of how they learn and develop differently, how they perceive reality from the opposite end of the reality spectrum, does it resonate with any of your experience? Well, yeah, it's... I can understand the feminine side because obviously, you know, you look at the, the that is not all male. <laughs> There's a balance there. And I think it's there for a reason. And I think, um, but everyone can tread the, tread the center line. Um, so yeah, I understand that there has to be the feminine essence in there. Um, and then, you know, um, I've trained women for a, a long time and I know that, you know, women, women have got it in them. Uh, like a lioness, they've got it in them. Like a mother bear? Absolutely, yeah. Protecting the young, that's it. Yep. Yeah, they, they can do it when they need to do it, but right. you need to get them the reason. That's right, that's right, that's right. So maybe this short discussion, we, uh, we've we addressed your question of, of what happened to Yang Lu Chan's system, but also how do we unfossilized Tai Chi. We don't mean to offend anybody. I mean, there's a lot of good Tai Chi practice going on today, but our opinion is just, it's not the full potential of it. Yes, sir. I'm sure there's lots of 
passionate people out there who who are like myself, you know, teachers, but they're all searching for the truth, for what is real Tai Chi. And that's why I really ad admire you to, st to stand out now and you're going to reveal the treasure um, of what real Tai Chi is. And as we've been discussing, real Tai Chi, if it's Tai Chi, the Tai Chi symbol, which is the essence of the change, which is the most important principle in Chinese culture and science the, from the Yijing. The Yijing is only a reference. The, the system of change and the training of it is separate from that book, which is a book of revelations, Shinda, they call it. Uh, I, I had some insights, so I'm going to render it into a, an explanation on a hexagram. But the actual science is how the yin yang of uh, the 24864, which is the Chinese cosmogony, which Confucius brought in, reflects in the constitution of the human body. And that's what needs to be brought in as the basis of a Chinese science that we can finally juxtapose with modern Western science. The reason the Chinese has not been so respected yet is because their version of science hasn't been complete. Modern science is very rigorous and very thorough. Let's say in 1850, you might find this interesting, Gray's Anatomy was published in 1850, exactly the same time. The Western view uh, description of the human body from a physical standpoint was published in 1850. It was a huge era of enlightenment in the 1800s in both China and the West, but the fact that China had that century of humiliation beginning in 1850 has uh, marred our perception of, of what was taking place really in China, which it was a revolution of thought. And as a scientist, that's what I, and a, also a philosopher and historian of science, which was one of my minors in college, that's what needs to be brought in as well to understand that when Taiji Tren and Bagua Tren, these two inventions of the 1800s was brought in, it was during a golden era in creativity and a revolution of Chinese thinking. So you're dead on in terms of Yang Lu Chan's brilliance. And there were more than just Yang Lu Chan. And we need to bring as many of these together as we can to come up with a picture of Chinese science that now can stand side by side and have conversation with Western science and not be considered mysticism, uh, qi, encounters with qi. That was the beginning. Eisenberg at Harvard and Bill Moyer and so forth. But it now it's way more beyond that, the inquiry. Steve, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope we can have some more further conversation on yes, this sir. question. Right. Uh, thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We'll talk soon. Take care. Thank you, sir. Thank you.